author Faze Moon Blake Cousins enjoy this incredible exclusive interview with Dr. Greer, myself included, with Dr. J asking the big questions. Listen up. Yeah, along with a special guest, he's working on something special. It's called Close Encounters of the Fifth Kind, Contact, Consciousness, and the Human Feature. Basically, one of the main purposes of the film is to show how each of us can be an ambassador by one practicing the so-called CE5 protocol, a cohesive group will achieve disclosure as there's no way an army of committed individuals can be stopped. Contact will be unstoppable. So joining us right now behind the incredible documentaries known as Sirius and Unacknowledged has his new documentary out. Dr. Stephen Greer is with us. Welcome to the show, doctor. Thank you. Good to be with you. I'm here in Washington. Absolutely. It's been a little while since we've had you on the show and a lot of things have been happening lately. And, you know, with this Netflix and your project, Unacknowledged, basically the most watched documentary on Netflix, most downloaded documentary on iTunes. I know you've got something special for us. We've been trying to get you on the show and you say you got something big. What's going down, Dr. Greer? Well, I, you know, I, I sort of the preface to this. Uh, first of all, I want to thank everyone who supported uh, Unacknowledged that was crowdfunded like we're doing this uh, project uh, so that we have complete control over content and editorial. And uh, the only reason we were able to do Unacknowledged, as hard-hitting as it is, um, it was that we were able to have the public support it and we were able to control it and there were no outside influences, corporate or otherwise, to influence that, that documentary and what the truth is. So um, we have a site, CE5Film.com, that uh, where people can go and support this next one. And this, this next project is a extension of actually the origins of my work uh, in this area. A lot of people may not know this, but uh, the Disclosure Project, the global disclosure movement that I founded in the uh, late 90s, about 20 some years ago, that was an outgrowth of Close Encounters of the Fifth Kind. And a lot of people go, what the heck are you talking about? And well, we were down on a beach in, uh, near Pensacola in 1992, it's 27 years ago, and we were, uh, I was teaching a group of people about remote viewing consciousness and making contact with ET civilizations for peaceful purposes. And we had four that appeared in the sky. They were videotaped and, and photographed and ended up on the front page of the uh, Pensacola paper. As a consequence of that, the intelligence community and the Pentagon folks reached out to me some very unhappy about what we were doing. Um, and the reason for that, and this is a punchline of this, is that the ultimate disclosure isn't anything the president or the Pentagon or Congress is going to do. It's what the people are going to do. And when I started this project in 1990, 29 years ago, this year, the whole concept was, was that the people should be ambassadors to these civilizations because the governments and the military have mucked it up beyond recognition. And so uh, the Close Encounters of the Fifth Kind concept uh, was born, and, and that's a term that refers to when humans initiate the contact instead of just passively observing something like a landing or a craft in the sky or ET being or what have you. The other categories of Close Encounters are all passive. This is the only one that is human initiated and cooperative. And so these protocols are based on an experience I had when I was a 18-year-old guy um, where it was made very clear to me that uh, interstellar civilizations are traveling through trans-dimensional uh, levels of physics that allow for very coherent thought to be interfaced with electromagnetic uh, communication systems, so let's call them that are not just telepathic, but are actually scientifically uh, reproducible and reliable like we would use a cell phone. And I think that what we're going to do with this documentary is to explore the science of consciousness and non-locality and what that entails and how people can do this because people can just bypass the government on this. There's no reason for people to be sitting on their hands waiting for whatever president or UN or whoever that, you know, I plowed that field a very long time ago when I started briefing uh, members of Congress and the Clinton administration and other people 
back in, in the early 90s. And, and I think that what we discovered is that the centers of power are never going to bite the hand that feeds them. They're just not. And the people will have to take this matter into their own hands. And that's what this film is about. It's an empowerment message. Um, and I think that uh, one of the key points of it is that, you know, in studies that have been done and uh, with uh, people who are very uh, proficient in, say, meditation, that if you send a group of meditators uh, into a city and it's 1% of that population, crime rates fall, uh, you know, general quality of life goes up, even though the other 99% of the people don't know those folks are in the city. So what they found with consciousness is that everybody's awake capability is actually a non-local field, like the entanglement concepts in quantum mechanics and physics, and that you can experience this state of consciousness, remote view where these ET craft are, and then connect to them. So that's what these protocols teach people to do, and if they're very effective. We now have some 40,000 people around the world um, uh, who are uh, doing this in various fashion. What we want to do is grow that to around 75 million people. Now, I know that sounds kind of outrageous, but keep in mind that the unacknowledged documentary has been seen in its first year by over 200 million people. Granted, a lot of those are on about 400 black sites or pirated sites. Um, however, the word it got, has gotten out very strongly on that. What we want to do with this film is create a mass activist movement of people making contact with these civilizations, bypassing uh, the normal blockade of, of governmental authorities and what have you that are completely dysfunctional or, you know, at best, passive and sitting on their hands. So the people need to, to take responsibility for this. I think it's about time we just share a sneak peek at what Dr. Greer is talking about, his new project, Close Encounters of the Fifth Kind Contact, Consciousness and the Human Future. Take a look at this. No one in the government in any classified capacity calls them UFOs or UAPs. They're known as ETVs, extraterrestrial vehicles. Um, they're, or they're called ARVs, alien, alien reproduction, reproduction vehicles, vehicles, which are the man-made ones. These other terms have been concocted by operatives because they're obfuscating. They're confusing. In other words, an un, you know an unexplained aerial phenomenon. Well, what the hell is that? A bolide? Uh, you know, uh, heat lightning? Uh, it's nonsense. They they come up with these obfuscating, confusing terms that are actually part of the cover up, and then they get everyone to use a post up culture or Tom DeLong or whoever it is. Yeah. They are not UAPs. They know goddamn good and well. Excuse my French. That these are not un, unexplained. They are not unidentified. And they're not aerial phenomenon because they're under the water, they're through the earth, they're in space. So these terms that are become popularized are being popularized by people who want to confuse people with a jargon that seems vague. Because the more vague you are, the less enlightened people can become. So let's cut through that nonsense right here. They are not UFOs and they are not UAPs. There are two things people are seeing out there, and those are extraterrestrial vehicles, which is what at the National Security Agency and elsewhere they're called, and they are ARVs, which are man made anti gravity systems uh, and, and spacecraft that were developed back in the uh, 50s. Uh, I, I will give you a date right now from a very excellent source who has been in, quote, the vault and have seen the original documents. Uh, that it was October 1954 that we mastered gravity control. Now, what is that? That means that you can cause an, an electromagnetic field around an object so that the object becomes essentially weightless uh, and can then go up and down and accelerate and turn at right angles. That was 1954. I wasn't born until 55. So I will tell you that in my entire lifespan, and I'm no spring chicken, uh, was we've had all these technologies and the reason they keep coming up with these stupid terms uh, that get adopted by the media and the UFO subculture is because it's a type of mind control. It, it causes people to use terms that are deliberately confusing to the public. So I, I recommend that people not buy into the disinformation of these fake 
terms that have been concocted by the intelligence community uh, through their cutouts who, who are enter it into popularized use in the media and elsewhere. All right, we're back with Dr. Stephen Greer, and I want to get this question into you because people are stating that disclosure in regards to that subject matter, the truth, some people have gone missing, some people have mysteriously disappeared, if not even, dare I say, uh, taken out in regards to disclosure. Uh, should some individuals, basically yourself and people that want to get into the disclosure of this, be scared for their lives? No. I mean, I think that what what could this fear do? Certainly, you know, I've experienced plenty of threats and uh, let's call them near-death situation uh, over the last 28, 29 years. But what was, my view of that is, look, I'm a trauma doctor, medical doctor, who's chairman of a busy emergency department. You know, I've seen people killed over a 50-cent beer or help somebody patted someone else's girlfriend on the fanny and out come the guns and knives. I think that when you're looking at what's at stake here, and that is, uh, quite frankly, the human future, not only technologically, but in consciousness, it's, it's nothing that I think people need to dwell on, on the fear factor for it. I think that uh, most people make too much of that. I'm not saying it's a paper tiger. There is a real threat there. But there's a way to do it so you mitigate the threat. And the number one way to do it is to do it in full view of, with a lot of people. You know, we did the National Press Club event in 2001 for launching the global disclosure movement. But, you know, that was seen by over 800 million people around the world. That creates its own protection. And so people have to understand that there's power and also safety in numbers. And that what everyone needs to, to do is to come together and work on this in a way that is quite open and out in the public, and that's your best approach. You know, I think you're right. We have uh, approximately, right here at Third Phase Moon, approaching 360 million views worldwide. And uh, you're right. I think once the word gets out, you, you got a mass amount of people listening to this and starting to uh, question the subject matter. It basically does protect the information in itself because it got out so quickly. And I think that's important. I think it's important what you're doing. Let me ask you the whole point of CE5. Did this just come to you one night? Did you wake up in the morning and go, hey, look, maybe I could actually create communication through no, these techniques no. about? Go ahead. Well, it, 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 to make a long story short, because I know we have limited time, uh, when I was 17, I got very sick. And um, I died. I had a near-death experience. And in the course of that experience, even though I was raised a very devout uh, atheist, my family were not, were not at all religious, I had this beautiful cosmic consciousness and uh, sort of a highly expanded state of consciousness experience. And it was beautiful, beyond belief, actually. And um, after, after that, I thought, well, gosh, you know, how do you get to this kind of consciousness without nearly dying? So I began to research uh, meditation techniques and started a type of Sanskrit uh, Vedic meditation and immediately advanced in, in ex really beautiful experiences in cosmic consciousness and higher states of consciousness. From that practice, about six months after the near-death experience, I was up in the mountains of North Carolina and I had hiked up to the top of this mountain right before sunset and I, I was about to sit down at the top of the mountain and meditate. It was up about 5,200 feet in October of 1973, probably before most of your listeners were born. And I, I went and looked towards the southwest, and there was a, a silver disc, a uh, seamless object of craft that materialized. And it's identical to the one I saw when I was eight or nine years of age where I grew up in Charlotte, North Carolina. I went, Ah, oh, they're back. I didn't think much more about it. I'm 18 years old, so it vanished. It didn't fly off. It just dematerialized in a clear sky up at that altitude. And I sat and meditated. I went into um, sort of a samadhi state, a very deep meditation. And at the end of it, I was in the meditation so long, it had gotten completely dark, and the Milky Way was up above my head. It was beautiful when I opened my eyes. And I stood up, and to my right was a, I don't know, or a foot or so ET that I didn't know was an ET. I thought it was a deer 
uh, with beautiful deer-shaped eyes sort of on its legs standing up, but it wasn't. It was a, one of these ET beings. touched me on my right shoulder, and I sort of quickly phased out of this dimension onto a craft where we basically created these protocols. Now, this is a true story, and people say, oh, how does a doctor get involved with all this stuff? Well, it isn't for any accident. So that was in 1973. Now, I didn't, at the time, understand this, what's called the physics of consciousness and electromagnetic systems that interface with each other, uh, which is the Rosetta Stone, frankly, of interstellar communication. And But over the years, there's been great research uh, at Princeton with Dr. John's lab, the Princeton Engineering Anomalies Research Lab, where they've done research with random number generators, uh, where you can put your awareness towards the random number generator without any physical touching of it or wires and shift it towards zeros versus ones and vice versa. The research on this aspect of consciousness as an infinite field that's boundless and transcends space and time is really quite dispositive. That's going to be featured in this, this uh, documentary as well to sort of root it in what the science is behind the not only remote viewing techniques but the contact protocols that we're using. But when I had this experience happening when I was 18, I honestly had no idea why it worked, but then I began to experiment with it. And when I did, there would be ET crafting all over that area of North Carolina uh, where I was up in college. So I didn't know what to do with it. So I sort of put it in the back of my mind and then experimented with it a few more times and had some really spectacular uh, and in a couple of cases, a mass witness event uh, happen as a consequence of this. And, and then I sort of left it alone until 1990 when I founded uh, the Center for the Study of Extraterrestrial Intelligence and, and thought, well, you know, it's really time for the public to learn about this. And, you know, I'm working full-time as a doctor, and I start this project around Close Encounters of the Fifth Kind, and a mass witness event happens, gets into the local media down in Florida, and then, of course, the intelligence community comes, comes out pretty, pretty quickly um, to discuss this because they knew that we, were, that we had discovered the Rosetta Stone of interstellar communication, that these civilizations that go beyond the speed of light are not using speed of light technologies like radio frequencies or fiber optics. They're using technologies that go beyond uh, superluminal, or let's call it, technologies that interface with coherent thought and consciousness field with very advanced electronics. So that, you know, that was the genesis actually of the disclosure project. What a lot of people don't realize is because of the CE5 success in the early 90s, people reached out who were both friendly and hostile to what we were doing. And the friendly people in the Pentagon and intelligence community wanted to have this, this issue resolved and understood that this is something that it was timely that we do. Of course, the people who I call the black hats who didn't want it out were you know, furious about it. And, you know, I got all kinds of threats from the head of Army Intelligence and what have you. And at one point, I had uh, the head of Army Intelligence offer me $2 billion if I would shut up, and I wouldn't do it. So uh, I think that, and then he went to my wife, tried to convince her. So, you know, he learned very quickly, A, I'm not for sale, and B, I can't be deceived with their stupid, uh, deceptive false flag operations, also known as abductions. So I think that this is, you know, one of the big problems in this whole field is people need to get off, not that I love your show, but they need to actually get out in the stars and do, do this on their own. They ne actually need to empirically experience this, and that's how I got involved when I was 18. So this is sort of an extension and outgrowth of that early experience that happened in 1973 up on a, a very high mountain up in North Carolina. Well, exactly. I think uh, on-the-ground reporting and being there is an important thing. And I want to ask you, in regard to the CE5 protocols, do you find it that if an individual practices these techniques or a collective group in one place meditating at the same time, do you get better results with more people uh, participating in this? To a point, 
Um, I think that now we're doing an event in Arizona up in the mountain uh, at the, the last week of May, and, and that'll be about 25 to 30 people. But I recommend that people do this with, you know, three, four, five, maybe eight people. The issue is coherence. Can a group be functional or dysfunctional? Can they be coherent? Uh, and the higher the coherence of the group, the more likely there's going to be a response because these civilizations are not interested in a bunch of disorganized squabbling primates uh, out somewhere in the field or in a mountain. They, they're looking for highly coherent, um, purposeful uh, individuals and groups of individuals. So that's what we're doing. Our, our recommendation is that people do this with people of like mind and then practice it. And we have an app actually that trains people to do this. Um, on, uh, you can find through our website, Sirius at Disclosure.com, S-I-R-I-U-S, Disclosure.com. Uh, but uh, if, you, if you look at this, what, one of the things we're going to feature in this documentary are just ordinary people from all over the world that have taken this up and very quickly had contact with, with uh, what public call UFOs, ET craft, and ET beings. And it's really astonishing stories. And we're also going to have photos and videos of these contact events that have happened. And, you know, this film is not being made for the UFO subculture per se. It's being made for the other 7.5 billion people on the planet who need to understand that we're in a world that is held back from its potential, not only technologically and, and the withholding of uh, very advanced energy and propulsion systems, but more importantly, this understanding and physics of consciousness and the power that that has. You know, Dr. Emoto, who was a Japanese researcher who had done work with the crystalline structures in water, as you thought, to water uh, or as water experienced various types of thoughts or emotions or the different crystalline structures that could be um, detected, that thought and consciousness actually is the prime mover on this planet and in reality. And we're, of course, very materialistic and reductionist society. And, you know, I'm a medical doctor. I certainly understand science and physics and what have you. But the real science of the next thousand years is going to be the science of consciousness and non-locality. And that has been withheld. That is a bigger secret. I'm telling everyone right now today, a much bigger secret uh, and more threatening to the status quo than a free energy device or zero point energy or anti gravity, because that is actually what creates the world. Well, getting to that point, when there is communication via telepathic uh, from a being of something, what exactly are we communicating with? Is it an interdimensional being? Is it an alien gray? What is basically wanting to respond back to us? Well, we're specifically, I don't use the word alien because it really in this country means people from another country. Um, nobody knows what an alien is. It's actually used as a xenophobic term to confuse people. So let's talk about two things that are growing on. And, and this little point of clarification is something also they do not want people to understand. There are extraterrestrial biological life forms that are from other star systems. There are also beings that are from other dimensions. And those, now, you know, not everything that goes bang in the night is an ET. It may be your great-grandmother popping into your bedroom and knocking off of, over a vase in a sort of poltergeist phenomenon. I think that the problem with this whole field is that there's a lack of understanding of a deeper cosmology, uh, which... I published a paper back in the mid-90s about this, uh, extraterrestrials and new cosmology, and the understanding and the discernment between an extraterrestrial uh, civilization and the different phenomenon, uh, phenomena that they can manifest and, and create, and the overlap that might have with some being that's from another dimension strictly. And people get very confused about this. And I, you know, I, one of the things I always say is that all interstellar civilizations are transdimensional, but not all interdimensional beings are extraterrestrial. That there are dimensions that are not ET that may still, people may experience. So 
this little point of clarification is really critical. If you go to our YouTube channel, which is youtube.com slash S Disclosure, S as in serious or steep, uh, so youtube.com slash S Disclosure, there's about 20 hours of discussion of this on that side, including some things we've done in the last year that sort of clarified uh, what it is and what the distinctions are. Now, you have to then add to that something even more confusing, and that is I would say at least 90% of the material put out on this subject unwittingly and sometimes wittingly by, by the media has to do with neither interdimensional beings nor ET beings, but our counterintelligence programs. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, if you, if you saw the documentary on Acknowledged, you know, there's an Air Force Office of Special Investigations guy that we get to admit, in fact, that the uh, intel community has staged abductions and has staged uh, ET events that are pseudo events. These sort of, the proper term at the Pentagon is a deceptive INW or indication and warning or a false indication and warning. The pop culture term is false flag operation. The counterintelligence community since the 50s have made it their purpose to obfuscate, confuse, deceive. And the public has mainly been fed a steady diet of disinformation on this subject. Uh, and that's why there are all these caricatures of like what you call a gray. Well, in reality, there are some ET species that look similar to those, but those have become a caricature that's been, uh, let's say, propelled forward by the intelligence community, and they have creatures that are human-controlled and made that look like grays that are on anti-gravity vehicles made by covert contractors uh, for the U.S. government, and those are used to stage abduction events, for example. Uh, let me give you another example. You know, one of the, one of the cases that, that he goes into, and I have multiple people in the Pentagon who have been involved with these projects at an unacknowledged special access level. Um, and where somebody might be out in a remote area near an uh, Air Force facility or a military facility and see something that they weren't supposed to see, say a test flight of an anti-gravity vehicle or what have you, they will then send in an abduction squad, human controlled, to abduct those people, to, you know, basically give them the alien experience and it's completely being done by humans. This is not conjecture. We know for a fact this is going on. We've known since the late 80s that this is what's going on. So one of the problems with this whole research area of UFOs, ETs, aliens, is all the things that are the catechisms of belief, so it's worse than the church, really, are things that have been put out there as sort of pre-positioned weapons of psychological warfare by the intelligence community that has been designed to scare the hell out of people. Why? Because as Werner Von Braun said on his deathbed, they want to present an alien threat because that crops up and justifies a massive military global presence that can't be justified by a handful of terrorists here and there. So the whole idea behind this has to do with the centralization of power and control. They do not want people to go out under the stars and do what we're recommending because if they do that, they're going to find that nobody's being harmed, no one's been threatened. I've been doing this since 1973, so that's 46 years, and I've never been harmed or frightened by an ET or any of those. The humans are the ones you got to be worried about. So the, the human uh, deceptive, the, the sort of things that the high-tech end of an unacknowledged special access project can do uh, would just astonish you. I mean, they can pretty much stage uh, an alien event, an alien abduction, all kinds of stuff. Uh, I know some of the original people who were involved in what are called mutilations, the cattle mutilations, and how that was being done. Of course, the, the UFO research, all of these, you know, it's so precise. There's no way that this is, could be anything but alien. Actually, the technologies that were being used to stage that had been developed by 1956. So I think that the public has been deliberately, uh, let's say, populated with ideas that are completely upside down 
And that's actually going to be one of the chapters of, of this documentary. It's going to be called Behind the Alien Mask, um, since you brought up the term, uh, where, where we go into sort of a review of what are the existing technologies that could stage an ET event, how do you discern that from an actual ET event? And that's going to be very important for the public to understand because if you go out there and, and you're with a group of people using the CE5 uh, protocols and practicing this, you're going to have events happen that are uh, interstellar. But there could also be something happen where they'll try to put in a, a, a military asset to confuse you. So it's going to be very important for people to understand uh, that there are multiple phenomena going on, uh, and then you just add to another layer of this when you ask the question of of uh, interdimensional. I had someone say once to me, I was at a, a Noetic Sciences board uh, meeting years ago with Jacques Vallée, and you know he was saying, well, these aren't ETs, they're interdimensional. And I got in front of everyone and said, look, if you understand the science of consciousness, this microphone I'm holding is interdimensional. Everything has a conscious component to it. The entire cosmos is a quantum conscious hologram. This is absolutely true. So that doesn't answer any questions. What you, you have to understand that there are realms and dimensions within the cosmos that aren't ET, but those shouldn't be confused with ET. But the ET civilizations, because they're going beyond the speed of light, they're traversing in those realms. They're traversing those other dimensions. They have to, because you can't go from the Andromeda galaxy two and a half million light years from here to Earth. We had an ET being that came to our event at Joshua Tree that was from Andromeda. We have a photograph of him, by the way. And this can't happen, you know, at the speed of light. It has to be at multiples of that, which means you are phasing out of 3D into 5D or 6D or 8D to go from point A to B. And the physics of this, by the way, are quite well known in classified projects. I think that the public needs to have this demystified and the mythology around it needs to get clarified so that people understand and have some clarity on what to look for and what's actually happening. Because I think right now it's, it's very confusing uh, to anyone who would try to look into this subject. Well, yes, the, the speed of thought, I've always kind of theorized that it's faster than the speed of light and basically disprove the theory of Einstein, his theory of the speed of light. That's the fastest that we could go. The speed of thought is definitely infinitely faster than that, in my opinion. But as far as this CE5... Well, no, I mean, let me stop you. It's not, it's not about your, okay. my opinion or your opinion. Just, there's science behind it. Here's the whole point of the film. There's excellent science, reproducible science that's been done on consciousness and thought affecting photons or random number generators or what have you, plants, uh, remote viewing, et cetera, and so on. And that has also been part of what's called the cover-up. Why? Because that leads you to an understanding of the cosmos, which turns the current order of the planet upside down. It, it, you know, we have it all backwards. We, we're a very reductionist, materialistic society, but in reality, we're dealing in a conscious holographic universe. So I think that that understanding is critical. There's no way you can understand an interstellar civilization, what their technologies entail, how they might appear and disappear in space-time without having a clear understanding of this. And so we're going to try to push the envelope. I mean, in a sense... Uh, unacknowledged was training wheels, so, you know, I call it UFO 101. This is going to be a much more in-depth look at the deeper truth and science behind uh, the ET presence, how they appear, how they vanish, what is involved with that, how are they communicating. And by the way, it's not just telepathic. We have electronic devices that we bring out to remote areas where there's no electromagnetic signals or sources, and they will, they will basically take over the circuitry of, say, a radar detector or a magnetometer that picks up magnetic field changes and begin to communicate in a very reproducible pattern. It's mind-blowing to go out there and have this happen. So we, we, we're, we have other equipment that we're bringing out that is not very expensive to get. I mean, you know, it's a couple hundred bucks or something. 
then you can go out into the stars and do this with teams of people, and that's what we're going to show. Uh, it sort of will be sort of an expose of how to make uh, interstellar contact. And if enough people do it, imagine. Yes, I mean, when I'm doing this with a group of people, they can deploy assets and put jets in the sky above us and stuff. And we have a video of this. Helicopters right off the hill from us, right overhead. We've had all that happen. But if you have millions of people doing this, they don't have that capability. So one of the things I always tell people, if you don't like the, the world that, you're, that you see out there, do something and change it. It isn't going to change by itself. And I think that it, we really have to look at this as sort of cosmic civil disobedience, <laughs> where we go out and we're taking this back under our control uh, as enlightened, intelligent humans. We're not going to just let the government and the military run roughshod over this subject because the people have infinitely more power than everyone thinks. I mean, most people give power to these big institutional players. That actually isn't where the power lies. It's just that people have to awaken to the power they have. And that power within us, this state of consciousness and understanding of what consciousness and thought is and how that can be used to make contact with these civilizations, that's really powerful stuff. I'll tell you right now, that that is the biggest, this is the biggest secret that's going to come out about all this. It isn't zero point energy and anti gravity. It's this stuff. Well, talking about being mind blown, power, power, with power comes great responsibility. Could we expect, well, let's back it up a little bit. I was pretty much mind blown <laughs> when I heard you, if I'm mistaken, I think you claimed that it was you that basically started the big stir. Maybe you weren't afraid, but a lot of people on the ground, tens of thousands of people were basically in shock from the Phoenix lights. Did you have something to do with that? And could we expect some more of these kind of events once your documentary comes out? Yeah, there will be. And I was there when that happened. I'll tell people what happened. This is something that certainly the media will never talk about. Certainly that I don't think the UFO community will ever talk about it. Um, I was flying into the Sky Harbor Airport in Phoenix to put together um, the best photographic and video evidence for UFOs that existed at the time. And this was in March of 1997 because in the following month, in April, we were doing a briefing for members of Congress and for senior uh, figures at the Pentagon, including the head of intelligence for the Joint Chiefs of Staff. And this was before the public disclosure project uh, was known. It was when we were, were trying to get the government to do something about this. And of course they refused to, but we were in the process of doing these briefings. So I did uh, the CE5 protocol as I was on final approach into uh, Phoenix airport. Uh, and a couple hours later, the Phoenix lights happened and the epicenter of it near Tempe where, where this came over uh, was right above the digital lab where we were putting together the evidence to give the members of Congress. And then that ended up being on the news locally. It didn't come out to the whole U.S. public for a couple of months in June, I believe, but locally it was on the news immediately. So we were able to include that footage in the materials we put together for briefing these figures on Capitol Hill and chairman of committees and, and uh, members of the the Pentagon, including the admiral in charge of intelligence for the Joint Chiefs of Staff. So. That was that was a CE5, um, and a Dr. Lynn Katai, who's also a medical doctor, had on her own, before she even knew of, of what we were doing, had been doing her version of Close Encounters of the Fifth Kind. And as you know from her work in her published book, uh, she, she had a series of amazing contacts with these uh, ET objects that would get, go beyond what happened that particular night in Phoenix. So... Uh, yes, I, I think that when, when people see the kind of uh, evidence and events that have happened around Close Encounters of the Fifth Time, uh, I think they'll be quite amazed. Also, a few years ago, the Ministry of Defense for France, I mean, uh, it's unfortunate about the Notre Dame Cathedral, but uh, the Ministry of Defense sent me a letter wanting us to basically do a, uh, an event to train uh, their, some of their people to make contact, and, and, and Admiral, Admiral Moran, who is 
an MD and a PhD in physics, by the way, uh, who, who was the, an, an admiral who was the, the liaison to the French president for us and also uh, the Ministry of Defense dealing with the, the UFO issue, uh, helped us set this up with, with a very prominent French family that had a, one of these oldest states that had 2,200 acres in uh, Brittany. And we did it, and they tracked objects going above us at 200,000 kilometers an hour making right-hand turns, and we had a, a, an object that partially materialized before sunset in the field with us out in this huge estate where they had set up a security perimeter. And that kind of stuff's going to be in this film. It, it's going to shock people. Um, you know, this is a much bigger story than, than what was in Unacknowledged by an order of magnitude. And I think that when people understand that these are ordinary people doing this, and I was friends with Ingo Swan, who was a very famous remote viewer, and he and I used to talk about this. Every single awake, sentient being, human or ET, has the ability to do what we're talking about here. Um, and, and connect to this aspect of consciousness that's not limited by space and time and learn to remote view and, and that intuitive part of ourselves and then make contact and communicate. This is, this is something that everyone thinks is so esoteric. It isn't esoteric at all. It's actually the root of being a conscious sentient being, i.e. a human or an ET. So that was one of the things we wanted to demonstrate to the Ministry of Defense in France. Um, I couldn't release that document, and here's the irony, I'm the founder of the Global Disclosure Project. I get this letter, but I wanted to cooperate with the Ministry of Defense, and at the time it was the French president with Sarkozy. Uh, and I really couldn't discuss it in the public until all those people, now Dr. Moran, is, uh, Admiral Moran has since passed away, Sarkozy is long out of power, so this, this whole chapter is going to be in the documentary also people are seeing ETVs or ARVs because it, hypothetically if they were using the bogus word UFO unidentified we both know as you just said they are identified flying sure they're not flying that's the whole thing <laughs> and if and Dr. Greer you know this as, as well as I do if you can create a gravitational field then things such as uh, wormholes become pos uh, possible, Einstein-Rosen bridges, cloaking, invisibility, and even time travel. And I think all of that is the missing piece that is the pie of humanity. Just that one thing once it's come to the public. But there's so well, many yes, but reasons. I mean, re re Remember what the secrecy has always been about, power. I mean, you know, and, and, and people say money, but I say, you know, when you're talking about hundreds of trillions of dollars uh, in oil and gas and surface roads and airplanes and rockets and all the other stuff we use, all of which have been at obsolete for 60 or 70 years, we're talking about macroeconomic and geopolitical power. That's what the secrecy is about. And we go through that in unacknowledged. Now, you know, people look at unacknowledged and they go, well, what can I do about this? Well, number one, we have a whole bunch of new whistleblowers from the uh, military and intelligence community coming forward. Uh, and we hope to be featuring those in the future. Uh, some don't want to be identified by name, but there are some that do that have explosive information. I go through some of that uh, tonight, if you wish. But the, the thing that's really going to be the ultimate changer of the status quo is the people, the masses of people, not just taking this subject as, a, as, a, as an object of fascination and sort of entertainment, but doing something meaningful. And what's beautiful is that we have something like 40,000 people on CE5 teams around the world, mm -hmm. and they come together, two, three, four, or five people. Um, I'm actually going to be um, uh, doing another expedition with about 25 or 30 people in the Arizona desert the last week of May. Um, if, if people want to come, there may be a few places left. If you go to our website, seriousdisclosure.com, but... People, we also have an app on iTunes and, and for Androids on that website you can get that's a ET contact training tool. Yes. And the ET contact tool 
actually has all the uh, remote viewing training, the, the, what the protocols are for close encounters of the fifth kind, and all of that on the app. And, you know, so I would say 99.9% .9 of the people doing this out there in the field have never met me, and they don't need to. Uh, I mean, you know, it's fine if they do. But um, realistically, I can't reach that many people personally, one-on-one. -on -one. But we have put these things together so that the public can be educated on it, go out and practice it, and then you'll be amazed at what happens. Um, you know, I was just meeting with the, one of the leaders of our teams down in New Zealand last week, and he was telling me about these experiences they've had that are mind-blowing, direct contact with ETs, ET craft, uh, ET beings with their team down in New Zealand. Now, some of those people have been with me on these uh, remote expeditions out in the desert or what have you, but most of them haven't. And most of them have just learned it through this app. Uh, so the, the point of this documentary that we're doing, because it will be seen by hundreds of millions of people, it's gonna be very, it's gonna be a very big uh, release that, that happens later this year. Our goal is to, this is ambitious, but if people will help support what we're doing at ce5film.com, we're gonna get this film completed by mid-September, have it come out uh, late November, December, and then we're going to roll and we're going to be doing all kinds of special events around this release so that the public understands that they can take control of this issue and really change the timeline of the future. And that's really what we're doing. Let's, let's, be, let's you know, bottom line this. Right now, our civilization is headed to going to hell in a handbasket. Yeah. It's it's abs it's absolutely on a terminal trajectory. I mean, and we're getting closer and closer to an extinction level event uh, in in the biosphere and geopolitically and in many other fronts. The only way that's going to change uh, is going to be through a mass movement uh, by the people. And I liken this a little bit to um, cosmic civil disobedience. I mean, I. <laughs> You know, it's a little bit radical to talk this way, but let, let's go back to when I was a child. Um, and when I grew up in North Carolina, there were separate black and white bathrooms and water fountains and all of that, Jim Crow. I remember it as a little boy. And then when I was in high school, I had an African-American girlfriend and was almost murdered and run over by a bunch of white supremacists. Wow. which are unfortunately in resurgency. And by, I was bicycling to school and they tried to kill me because I was dating a black girl and I was a white boy in the South. Um, now, I'm not that old. So, you know, we, we have to realize that how did all that change, even though we haven't made a complete transformation on these issues. It's a lot better than it was when I was a young man. Um, well, it was by what Martin Luther King did with civil disobedience. Uh, it was nonviolent action, but it was something that the, the masses got behind. And it eventually forced the political establishment to deal with it. Well, that's what we need to do now. And it, you know, just, you know, sitting on your hands and kvetching uh, and complaining isn't going to fix it. So when a lot of people begin to do something like this, it not only says to our fellow humans that we're ready to be open contact with these civilizations. It says to the ETs that humanity is ready. And believe me, that's what they're waiting for. And they're, they have not gotten a satisfactory answer from the military intelligence complex or the government. They've either been shooting at them, denying them, covering it up, all kinds of dysfunctional nonsense since World War II. I mean, since the era of the Foo Fighters. Uh, by the way, to all of you listening, yes, there's a rock band called the Foo Fighters, but they yeah. named their band after these things in World War II that were called Foo Fighters, uh, which were basically what uh, these EP craft were called back in the European theater of operations in World War II. And so this has been known for a very, very long time. And to really make this change, it's going to have to be a mass movement that, as I said earlier, 
people going out and directly taking control of this situation and the relationship between humans and these ET civilizations bypassing the government, just leaving, will leave the Pentagon, the CIA, and the governments behind because they have failed us. And so it's time for we the people, to use the term, uh, Jeffersonian concept, that we the people take control of this issue and determine our future, not sit around and wait for somebody at 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue or 10 Downing Street or anywhere else to do it. I think that is the biggest mistake I hear in the disclosure movement. You know, I founded the global disclosure movement back in the, the late 90s and early 2000s. Um, and and what the reason I did that was because I had already, let me give a little history lesson here. Our team had already briefed the president, the CIA director, the UN secretary general, the ministries of defense in Great Britain and Canada and elsewhere. And nobody wanted to either were out of the loop on this and had no access because of the nature of these illegal, unacknowledged special access projects, which is the proper military term for a black project, or they were in the loop, but agreed with the secrecy and didn't want to do anything about it. You had those two both equally dysfunctional situations. That's why in 1998, I said, that's it. The, the White House has taken a pass. The Congress has taken a pass. We briefed, I personally briefed many members of Congress, Senate uh, Intelligence Committee members, etc. Nobody really had the courage to take this on, which is why we did the Global Disclosure Project event at the National Press Club in 2001, May 9th, 2001. This will be the 18th uh, anniversary in about a month from now. In fact, a month from today, interestingly, is the 18th year anniversary of that. That event was seen by nearly 1 billion people around the world. But ultimately, what has happened since then is that the majority of the world's population believe we're being visited and that we're not alone in the universe. But the governments of the world are still the white hats, let's call them the legitimate governments, locked out of the USAPs. The USAPs don't want to rock the boat by bringing this information out. So it's a stalemate. That in needs to, to step there for the average people, the, the, the people of the United States and of other countries around the world that are going to say, no, Moss, we're done with this. We're going to take control of this situation ourselves, and we're not waiting for Big Brother to do it for us. And this film, CE5Film.com, that, that's why we're doing it, because we first had to let – me, let me go a little bit about my strategic logic. I had to take this to the governments first to see if they would do it. They took a path. We then did Disclosure Project because the public needed to be educated on this, and then we've continued that process all these long 18 years uh, and did the film Unacknowledged that came out two years ago uh, this month, uh, which has been seen by hundreds of millions of people. That's an educational process so that people understand, A, we're not alone, B, that the governments are broken, and C, that the technologies that are being hidden would give us an entirely new civilization without pollution or poverty. But what has been the heart and soul of what I've been doing, John, since 1990 is the Close Encounters of the Fifth Kind Initiative, where humans take the initiative to make contact. Because that, ironically, is what actually started the whole disclosure movement. The only reason I got involved with these uh, labyrinthine and Byzantine crazy government uh, programs dealing with this is because we had successfully made contact with ETs and the intelligence community knew it. And they came to me, quite frankly, less than pleased. They were extremely upset. And, uh, you know, you know the story. I had three people on my team assassinated. Mm -hmm. I was yep. almost killed. Uh, you know, former CIA director Bill Colby was trying to help us. And they found him floating down the Potomac, south of Washington. And I think that over those years, what I realized is that not only does disclosure have to happen by we the people, but contact, which has been mismanaged by a militaristic approach to the ET presence, has to be taken on by the public. And that's why we started 
what we call ambassadors to the universe. It's sort of a citizen's diplomacy effort where everyday people go out, learn these techniques, which are quite simple to do, make contact and offer to make contact within the construct of peace. And guess what? Thousands and thousands of people have done this and successfully had experiences not only with ET craft in proximity to them, but also ET beings. So this is what these civilizations are waiting for. They're waiting for a critical mass of humans to say, we're here, we're ready, we understand you're out there, in fact, you're all around us, and we're ready to go forward with a peaceful relationship on Earth and in space. It, it is really very simple. That's all that they're waiting for. People say, why don't they land on the White House? I remember Larry King, who used to be a guy on uh, CNN. Mm -hmm. Why aren't they landing on the White House lawn? I said, well, who's White House? Why the American White House? That's right. We're only 5% only four percent of the world's population. Why not the Kremlin? Uh, yeah, why not the Kremlin? Why not the White House in uh, Brazil or wherever? So I said, you know, the, the main point here is that this is something that the public has to take responsibility for because, you know, ultimately, if we are to pretend, if we're going to be in an open and free society and be democratic at all, we should be looking to the government to lead on these difficult issues. The people need to lead on them. And I've said for 25 years that the people will lead, the leaders will follow. The leaders always are a lagging indicator. They do not lead. We don't have leaders anymore. We have people who put their finger to the wind and see which way the wind is blowing. I mean, I have a very close friend of Bill Clinton's who told me after we did these briefings for, for those guys and for his CI director that basically he puts his finger, licks his finger, puts it out, sees which way the wind is blowing, and that's where he's going to go. And since the center of power wanted to keep this secret, he went along and didn't rock the boat. He didn't want to rock the boat. And he was too afraid to rock the boat. So this means that the courage, the moral courage, and the leadership needed to do this, it, it, these come from all of us, not just me, but everyone listening right now, the, the couple million people who are listening to this show, absolutely need to understand that the ball's in our court, not the, the, the U.S. government or the United Nations. Now, I, we both know that the presidents, one of the biggest reasons that they are not briefed is because there are short-term employees, four to eight years max. Why would they brought, be brought into the USAPs? Why? Well, that's the whole, the whole point is that it's a constitutional crisis. And one of the reasons for the secrecy is it's not that spectacular a reason. It's inertia. I mean, once something gets classified at this level where they're deceiving the Congress and the president and it's being run un unconstitutionally, then, you know, how do you come clean on that? It would be a thousand times bigger scandal than Watergate or Iran Gate or whatever, or, you know, Monica Lewinsky yeah. or whatever. Any of those would just be a joke compared to this. And so I think that, you know, as one admiral said to us, you know, he was an admiral in charge of CONUS, Continental U.S. Security. And he said, look, this is too big a fish. Uh, I don't want to have to manage this kind of change. No one wants to rock the boat. And he says, basically, my job is to maintain the status quo of the world energy supply and oil and the petrodollar and all of that. He says, all of this information coming out changes that. And he says, I just want to get out of this command and retire and go fishing at my ranch in Montana. No, I'm not kidding. I mean, I have had meetings with multiple senior people who are read into or military speak for briefed on this issue. They, they just don't want to deal with it. It's too, it, it's too big of an issue. It's easier to keep the lid on the secrecy. So meanwhile, of course, the world is, is in a, a, a biosphere collapse. And, you know, you have half the world's population in poverty. And long before we pump out that barrel of oil and burn it, uh, we'll have so many people dying from 
uh, other effects from due to all the pollution and, and the death of the oceans and everything else that, you know, these issues are, I hate to say it, too big for today's politicians to deal with. And they would prefer just to kick the can down the road. So a lot of the secrecy, a lot of people say, oh, it's so diabolical. I say, well, some of it is diabolical. But a lot of it is just, it's easier just to go along with the status quo. And when you start talking about the president, I had a meeting. I'm here in Washington at my place here, and I'm looking at the White House and the Washington Monument as we speak and watching the jets landing at National Airport. I'm up high on a building. And, and what's interesting is I had a man that was involved with George W. Bush um, yes. uh, administration. And we had dinner up the street from my place here at, at the university club. And, and, you know, Donald Rumsfeld was in there. All these sorts of people were there and we were having dinner. And he said, look, he said, look, Dr. Greer, here's the thing. It doesn't matter if you're liberal or conservative. Once you get into the white house, you govern in a conservative manner, meaning you don't want to rock the boat and bringing out the fact that we're not alone in the universe that the world has been visited by advanced civilizations, not just for decades, but for millennia, that there are technologies that we've developed that would terminate oil, gas, coal, nuclear power, eliminate the need for surface roads because we'd be able to levitate over the land in these anti-gravity things. He says no president wants that much change to manage. He says so no matter whether they're left, right, center, they're going to govern in a, this is too big to, to rock the boat. And it, it doesn't matter that if we don't deal with these issues, we're headed for the scrap heap of history. We're like dinosaurs. But they don't practically, as politicians, they don't want to deal with it. So guess what? We, the people, need to deal with it. We have to deal with it. This collective CE5 group is seen in the sky, and then it so happens ordinary people are witnessing the same event. How does that affect that person's mind that had no idea what was going on? What are the ramifications of this? Well, of course, it, it's a mind-expanding and life-changing event, and, and this is what's going to start happening more and more all over the world. Um, I will tell you that the, what the ETs are waiting for uh, is – it's precisely enough people to be awake and to be welcoming and nonviolent and non-militaristic towards them in order to have further contact. This all could have happened in the 50s before I was born. The problem is it got hijacked by militarists who wanted to make hay out of it, and it's gone south ever since. Uh, Eisenhower lost control of these projects, the USAP era was born in, in the late 40s and early 50s, the unacknowledged special access projects that are so deep black that most presidents are never read into or briefed on most of them. And I think that uh, this, this creates a, a dysfunction governmentally because a lot of people say, well, you know, when is the president going to do this? But I said, wait a minute, we're doing disclosure. The people are, we the people, not me. We the people are doing disclosure. We the people need to make contact. I said, how in the world does, and, and this, I, I, I will paraphrase what the CIA director said to me when I was briefing him. He says, how do we disclose something we don't have access to? Because the president and the CIA director were being denied access, even though they were making specific inquiries. Uh, I put together a briefing for the head of intelligence for the Joint Chiefs of Staff, Admiral Wilson. And before that briefing, I, I brought... Um, uh, astronaut Edgar Mitchell with me to because he was learning about this and you know I was sort of helping him explore this whole subject and before I get there I send this document that has the project code names and code numbers on it uh, it's in the documentary in the book unacknowledged and but at that time I mean it was, this was back in 97 22 years ago and it, this month in fact uh, on, on April 9th um, around that attempt, something like that. So what happened is that before we got to the briefing, he had made inquiries to one of these uh, USAPs, uh, super secret projects, and uh, that he, he recognized that the code for it, he didn't know what they did. And when he contacted them, he said, I'm an 
Admiral Wilson. I'm the head of intelligence for the Joint Chiefs of Staff. And I want to be read into, which is military speak for brief, on, on this subject. And they said, sir, you don't have a need to know. And he said, God damn it, how can I not have a need to know? I'm the head of intelligence for the Joint Chiefs of Staff. And they said, sir, we will not discuss this with you and hung up on him. So by the time Edgar Mitchell and I and my military advisor and a few other people got to this meeting, this admiral was scared and furious. I mean, livid. And at the end of the meeting, I asked him to help us. And he says, what can I do? I said, he says, who else have you dealt with that has been denied access to these programs? I said, well, the president, the CIA director, and the secretary of defense. He says, well, then what the hell am I going to do? He says, I don't have nearly that kind of constitutional legal authority, and they're being lied to. And he looked me square in the eye, and he says, as far as I'm concerned, you have my permission as the head of intelligence for the Joint Chiefs of Staff to disclose any document, any witness, any testimony, because those projects are being run completely illegally. And a lot of people have asked me, did anyone ever in official capacity greenlight the disclosure project? I said, yes, the head of intelligence for the Joint Chiefs of Staff of the United States. That's who did. Not that I needed his approval. I would have done it anyway. But it was an interesting perspective. Now, this is much bigger than that, because this is basically going to hand off to the public the skill set to make direct contact and bypass the, the dysfunctional governmental institutions that have failed us. And this is real empowerment. So we really need people to, to support this. Uh, our, our fundraising that just started a few weeks ago, uh, it's at ce5film.com. Uh, it's a very easy uh, site to navigate. And it, unless people get behind that, and I, I, I point out, we do not accept funding from any corporation uh, or entity that could water down the truth about this. So that's one of the beauties of doing this in a crowdfunding way. There's, we're not dependent on anybody. Now, granted, most people end up seeing these documentaries like Unacknowledged and Series or seeing them for free, but what it does is it gets the message out to hundreds of millions of people, literally hundreds of millions. But if we can get 1% of the population to actually go out in a higher state of understanding and consciousness and make contact, that will change the other 99% remotely, just through the morphogenic field, as it's called, of consciousness, the non-local field of consciousness that isn't limited by space and time. And when enough people do something that's uh, positive, good action, uh, and, and this understanding of, of what the deeper aspect of our conscious mind is, then that can change the course of, uh, you know, sort of I call it the extinction level event trajectory that our civilization is on. I mean, right now we're headed over, you know, going to hell in a handbasket, for, for lack of a better term, because we are not doing the things we need to do proactively, and the majority of the public have become passive consumer cows. And they're, no one's with really, they're just floating along uh, as, as the barrel of, of, that we're in about is about to go over Niagara Falls. And, and I think that what we're trying to say is, look, we need to have enough people who understand the positive course of action, not only for disclosure and these technologies, but the underlying science of consciousness and contact that has to happen. Because it really doesn't matter if we had free energy on this planet and solved the world's environmental problems if we get into an interplanetary war, which is what these psychopaths who are part of these USAPs want to do. They want to provoke an interplanetary conflict. And as Werner von Braun said, this is all a hoax. It's all a fake. But let's face it, there have been a lot of conflicts and wars we've gotten into. I mean, I remind people, Vietnam was greatly expanded from the Gulf of Tonkin incident, which was either completely staged by us or exaggerated so that there would be a public outcry so that uh, Congress would demand that Lyndon Johnson expand the Vietnam War. And the military-industrial complex and warmongers were behind that. So I think we have to all be aware of the risks of our own passivity and you know, sort of take uh, the bull by the horns here 
I'm not talking about engaging in a violent encounter with the military or intelligence community. I'm saying let's just leave behind. Let's just go forward in a positive way. And that's really what the Disclosure Project did, and that's what we're going to do with this global CE5 initiative. Well, our audience right here at Third Phase Moon, they love seeing UFO videos. And I think we've got one of the biggest, uh, largest archives of UFO videos from around the world over the past nine years that we've been doing this at Third Phase Moon. And I've noticed over the past couple of years, it seems that the UFO activity, the phenomenon has slowed down as far as, you know, good videos out there of UFOs. There are here and there, there are a few, but it seems like it's dramatically kind of decreased in its sightings from around the world. And I'm wondering, maybe after this documentary, the CE5 project that you're working on, that we're going to be expecting a lot more UFO video activity. And that's what we want. What's your thoughts on that? Well, I don't mean, you know, after you've seen 1,000, 2,000 photos and videos of UFOs, what does 2001 mean? Nothing. Um, I think that, not to diminish what you just said, but I mean, it, it, you know, sitting around in your pajamas and flip-flops uh, cruising the internet for UFO videos is not going to change the world. Um, we're really about making the world uh, move it onto a path of it, us becoming a peaceful level one uh, uh, intelligent civilization taking its place amongst other civilizations that are out there. Now, your question strikes to something that we probably don't have time to go into, but beginning in the mid-60s, the military and covert USAPs began to have, uh, let's call them advanced satellite type systems in space that had electronic weapon systems on them that would target ET craft. That has, that, now that's 54 years ago. You can imagine the extraordinary development and technology that has uh, gone on since then I just had a man who was at the technology management office in the sub-basement of the Pentagon who was read into one of these more recent, this is maybe in the early to mid-2000s, uh, systems where they could target any volume of space out there and obliterate anything that would come into 3D So with these systems. And I think that one of the problems, and this is this is a huge one, is that the ETs are manifesting in ways that are increasingly trans-dimensional as opposed to 3D because when they're in a fixed material form, they're, it's like shooting you know, fish in a barrel. Um, and, and unfortunately, this, you know, I, I remember having a meeting with the head of the Defense Intelligence Agency here in Washington some years ago, and General Hughes and I were discussing this, and I said I, he was not read into these projects but I said the most dangerous thing going on that you don't know about as the director of the Defense Intelligence Agency, which is like the CIA for the Pentagon, uh, military intelligence, is that there are uh, unsupervised, unacknowledged special access projects that have extraordinarily advanced technologies that are targeting and with increasing accuracy hitting and disabling or destroying ET vehicles uh, and that is a real problem to all the sort of people who love to have someone to hate. I call them the haters out there. Who, you know, I mean, you know, look, we live in a time where, you know, if you can't be overtly racist and homophobic, you can at least hate the aliens, right? So that's what it's all about. It's finding someone new to hate. Um, so the people who are addicted to hatred, they're never going to like this message I'm about to give. But we're going to have to find what our common root is on a deeply spiritual basis between humans and these other civilizations. And what that is, is not our common humanity because they're not human. It's the fact that we're all conscious sentient beings and we're going to have to find how do we communicate and have contact with these civilizations in some other way besides down the barrel of a gun or electron, electromagnetic a scalar weapon system. And I think, you know, this is, one of the reasons why this film is of some urgency is that a lot of people don't understand that technology doesn't stand still, that the technologies of the 60s or 80s or 90s or even the early 2000s are not the technology of 2019 and an unacknowledged special access project that deal with this that have had trillions of dollars to develop 
uh, covertly these sort of uh, technologies and weapon systems, which are certainly not disclosed to the United Nations or other countries and to most of the people in our leadership in this country. So I think that this is why there needs to be, uh, you know, I'm a medical doctor. I remember during the Cold War, there was something called the Physicians for Social Responsibility that were doctors who would go from America over to the Soviet Union and vice versa as a way of opening dialogue because the governments were locked into this death row of mutual assured destruction and nuclear standoff. And I think that we have to sort of view that we're at a time where humans, ordinary people like me and you, need to take responsibility for the relationship between humans and these other civilizations that are out out there. And and that it's it's critical that we do so, that it, time is not on our side not to take action because the the people who have the most powerful technologies intend to use them as agent provocateur, to provoke a conflict. Uh, with these civilizations, which would not be a survivable event. I mean, if people think mutual assured destruction with thousands of nuclear weapons would be a problem, go, you know, 40 orders of magnitude past the nuclear level and have systems that are weaponized and think, you really think we're going to have a battle that is survivable. So all you Star Wars guys, it's great for science fiction, all the people with all their fantasies about intergalactic war, here's the cliff notes on this. Once you get past the nuclear threshold of technological prowess and mastery, once you step beyond that, you're dealing with longitudinal, scalar, faster than the speed of light systems that when those were weaponized and deployed would destroy an entire planet almost instantly. You're not going to be shooting at each other with laser beams like Star Trek. So people need to understand that there is a limit to violence and to conflict and an us versus them paradigm. You know, people love cowboys and Indian movies and, you know, war stories and all that. You know, the human race is addicted to all this conflict. But if we keep on that path, and, and, and which is unfortunately where we've been for 60, 70 years, on, with this, we're, it's, it's a very dangerous game being played. The only way to resolve it that I can see um, unfortunately, since there's not been a president, and I've put briefings together for every president since uh, Clinton, is, is, is that the people are going to have to take responsibility for this. And, and I think that's where it should be. I mean, every great revolution, nonviolent revolution, you look at the civil rights movement, you look at what happened with Gandhi in India, that has to be something that the people do. I mean, we have to do this, all of us, not me, not you. Everyone needs to start taking responsibility for this. And when we awaken to that and kind of get off our smartphones and computers and actually go out with a group of like-minded people and do this, we'll be very surprised at how friendly the welcome is. They're waiting for us to wake up. Why do you believe that they want this whole program and the fact that before you were even born, the anti-gravity technology existed. Why under wraps? What's the fear aside from money and military? That's the only thing that I keep getting from other people. Well, no, the, the biggest, it, it actually had nothing to do with, with that. It had to do with the fact that the industrial base that runs the planet, whether it was in the late 1800s or the 20s or the time of Nikola Tesla or the time of P. Townsend Brown, who in the 20s was doing experiments with anti-gravity and uh, high-voltage systems and crystalline materials with levitation resulting, look this up yourself, it's all true, or, 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 or the people who have had to center of power have never been government people per se. They have been the industrialist and the financial banking moneyed people. But at the level of not just your odd, you know, Jeff Bezos with his $140 billion is not a significant player on the world stage until you start talking about trillions of dollars. And that's what we're talking about here. So let, let me answer this, answer the question quite clearly. The disclosure of this information would 
alter literally over a thousand trillion dollars worth of assets uh, that are being protected by people who are a relatively small number of uber huge global elites that want to maintain the status quo. So cartels and the status quo, whether you can go back hundreds of years in human history, probably thousands, they never wanted to see that kind of change happen because let's look at this for a moment. If you bring out this information and, and let's say millions of people start making contact through close encounters of the fifth kind protocols, which we'll get into in a moment, what those are and how they work. What, what happens at that point is that you can't put the lid on this anymore. You don't need an executive order from the president. It becomes self-evident to too many people all over the world that we're not alone. The very first thing people are going to ask is, well, how are these things moving? How are they going from point A to B at, you know, unbelievable speeds and making right-hand turns, which we have videos of. You're going to see in this documentary that's coming out, CE5 contact events that our team have had that will blow your mind, absolutely blow your mind. Well, those aren't using jet engines or no. propeller no, planes or rockets. Not. Okay, so when that happens, the, 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 the answer will, will come, and the answer will be, oh, well, there's a whole other level of physics and science and technology that's been classified, and that being brought forward will terminate the need for oil and gas and coal and public utilities. But what does that do? Let's analyze this one bit deeper, a, a secondary, tertiary level, deeper level. It means that every village and every home and every town at the local level will be completely self-sufficient for energy and ultimately for manufacturing and, and all their needs without the supply chain, without the super tanker line that's coming from Saudi Arabia or the oil fields of Texas distributing all over the place. So that means that power, true power, will, will go back to the people. This is the ultimate democratization uh, technology. Uh, and, and for people who are more conservative libertarian, it's, it's like a wet dream for them. I hate to say that term. But, but the reality is that we have that technology fully developed in classified projects. But bringing them out through a corporation or bringing them out through the government, it's, they're not going to bite the hand that's feeding them. They understand the power. Uh, I mean, let's look at it this way. The U.S. federal budget is four or five trillion. Our national debt is 21 trillion. We're talking just commodities, future trading, at the Chicago Board of Trade, and these kind of commodities is in the order of hundreds of trillions of dollars a year. So wow. I'll tell you right now, I'll tell you right now where the power is. It isn't at 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue, and it isn't at the Capitol. It's in these vast... Uh, fortunes and uh, asset bases uh, that are in the, the banking and corporate and financial world. And that's the tail wagging the dog. So ultimately, with this knowledge coming out, it means that all those super elites, the ones who are not the 1%, but the 0.000001%, they're going to have to actually adapt to a new uh, civilization that isn't dependent on this centralized power that's really based on economic activity and financial instruments and things of this sort. The, the whole petrodollar, uh, the, the reserve currency of the world is based on the petrodollar, yep. which is based on oil. So all of that changes, and it needed to change uh, many years ago, even before World War II, during the era of Nikola Tesla and J.P. Morgan and all those stories where all this technology was actually beginning to be experimented with. And, and even then, the industrialists didn't want to get it out. And the big, very wealthy families, a, a number of whom I know, are, are to this day very conflicted about it. I mean, let's take, you know, everyone makes much noise about the fact that I 
I knew Lawrence Rockefeller, and he set up the meeting for Hillary and, and Bill Clinton at his ranch, and he had had me out there and some, some other folks. Um, Lawrence was a philanthropist. His brother, David, Chase Manhattan Bank, which is now J.P. Morgan Chase, was furious with Lawrence because Lawrence was the one wanting to see this change happen. And the Rockefeller clan was completely split on this. Uh, his his nephew, who was head of the Senate Intelligence Committee, Jay Rockefeller, West Virginia, was also livid with Lawrence for doing this. So, but you can't. Everyone wants these sort of stupid, vast conspiracy theories, which frankly really are are just dumb as a sack of hair, uh, without any nuance. So let's get into a little bit of nuance, since you have we have an uninterrupted commercial free platform. Yes. There are a lot of there are a lot of families out there that are in that world that would like to see this change happen. But the center of gravity, the power is still in the ones, the branches of those families and corporations and institutions that are controlled by people who don't want this big of change to happen because they don't know how to manage the change. Uh, they know that it means it would be a reduction of their relative power in the world, um, et cetera, and so on. So, uh, you know, meanwhile, we're destroying the planet for no good reason except this kind of nonsense. Now, imagine, let, let, let's step back a little, a little deeper and go a little deeper. Imagine how these civilizations from other star systems might view a squabbling bunch of humans that are destroying their entire biosphere and all the oceans when the solutions already exist. They, it, it, you know, they're extant. They're not ones that even need to be invented. And those have all been clamped down and kept secret because of this megalomaniacal power trip that a very small percentage of humans are on. And because the flip side of that coin is the populace as a whole is misinformed and apathetic. One of the things that I've always said is you really can't complain about the power elites if you aren't doing anything about it, because the truth is, this is how democracy works. This is how a civilization evolves. It doesn't evolve by a handful of elites doing it for you. It means we all have to do the hard work ourselves. And I know no one likes to hear this message, but if everyone wants to sit on their computer and smartphone and in, in, in their pajamas and flip flops and, and just be entertained with shock and drivel. But the fact of the matter is, we have to all become activists. We all have to become Martin Luther Kings or Gandhi or uh, the people who actually cause great and wonderful social, social change and, and uh, civilizational development over the pa past few hundred years. Uh, you know, I look back at my, my mother's family who fought in the American Revolution where the very first prisoner of war with the British, ironically. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I have no uh, problem with the British now, but uh, we were the, some early POWs. And had those people not been willing to risk everything as a little ragtag army, you know, the colonial army under George Washington, we would have never had the United States now. That we'd still be a vassal state of, of the United Kingdom. So I think that if we want to see this planet evolve to the next level, which has to be a level that's not just world peace, but what I call universal peace. Well, when you state it the way you just did, as far as basically a little kid with a stick poking the bear, we don't want any conflicts. And again, I think disclosure is in our hands. It's not in their hands. It's basically, it's up to us. And uh, what you've been stating here on Third Phase of Moon tonight, it's been an eye-opener, let me tell you. Let me um, ask you just one last question here. We're going to be supplying the links uh, to the effort for the documentary to get it out. When do you expect this new film to be released? Well, we hope to have it finished by mid-September this year, and then it should come out uh, at the end of this year, 2019, and um, uh, you know we'll have a, a big premiere in, in LA. I hope a lot of people who are listening can come. And uh, we want this to be bigger than unacknowledged, which, as I said in the first year, I had over 200 million people see it around the world. I think that this one 
will be bigger because it's going to cross over into the consciousness community, people who are interested in advanced science of consciousness, meditation, and where the interface between that and interstellar is. That's really what this is about. And I think, you know, if we can get enough people to begin to uh, take responsible uh, ability for, for this relationship and practice this, you're going to see events happening all over the world um, and that are beyond the control of the military intelligence community. And I have to tell you, decentralizing this, I mean, one of the problems, if, if I go out and do this, it's obviously known. But if there are millions of people doing it, there the covert programs have a lot of assets. They don't have that many assets. So they can't suppress all the activity. They can do things that suppress what's happening if it's a very small number of people. Uh, and But they can't. It becomes an overwhelming movement, a wave that uh, not only from a tactical point of view uh, overwhelms these secret programs, but from a consciousness point of view, it shifts uh, the whole trajectory of human uh, thinking and, and the future. So, you know, this is how we manifest the future. And, and I want, to, if at all possible, we want to have this film out before the end of this year. I hope I'm with the actually, uh, the, the, the distribution and company and, and iTunes and all those are very excited to get this later this year. And we're hoping it will be out um, before the holidays. Well, Close Encounters of the Fifth Kind, Contact, we're going to be supplying the links. Everybody take a look at that. Go visit Dr. Greer's incredible new project, and I can't wait to uh, see what he's got coming up next, because it sounds like you got some really great video and insight, and you're going to keep in touch, right, Dr. Greer? When this uh, comes out, we want you back on here. Oh, yeah, yeah, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll stay in touch with it, and I appreciate your help. Um, you know, I just want to say to everyone, this is all in your hands now. I mean, uh, when I started this project, I had children that are the ages of my grandchildren now. So that was 29 years ago. And, I'm, I'm, you know, I kind of feel like we need people who are coming along who can pick up the torch and go forward with this in a very positive way. And, you know, forget about all the conspiracy theories and fear-mongering. Just it's a beautiful experience to get together with people of like mind, go out under the stars, invite these civilizations to interact with you and see what beautiful things happen. It is really beautiful. Everyone who comes on these week-long expeditions with me, and I do them a few times a year, their lives are changed, not because of me, but because of what's happening with these ETs and with uh, the science of what's happening, but also the personal experience. It's really amazing. And I think people need to say, wow, this, this, this opens up a whole universe to us that that it is, has always been folded within us. There's in a sense that everything anyone needs to know is already folded within them. Yeah, I'm just trying to think. Uh, millions of people collectively at one time practicing the CE5 technique, the possibilities are huge. Dr. Greer, appreciate you joining us right here at Third Phase Moon. You be safe and uh, we'll keep in touch. Thank you. Appreciate your help. All right, everybody. Uh, thanks for joining us. That was Dr. Greer. Make sure you take a look at the link below. It's been my pleasure broadcasting here tonight. Everybody, keep your eyes on the skies. We're not alone. Blake Cousins. We'll see you again next time.